So now let's see how we can take our funnel tactics and knowledge of vowels and consonants and group things up into syllables. Now we have a pretty good intuition about syllables if you are a native speaker of a language. For example, in elementary school, you probably learned to clap to sound, like instrumental would be four claps. Instrumental. Uh, so we would know this has four syllables. In fact, the fact that kids can do this without any linguistic training tells us that syllables do in fact ex exist. So what about marketable? Marketable. Marketable. This is going to be four syllables. Now what about this last one? Well, if we take a look at the first two, we might guess that it's the amount of vowels that we have that determines how many syllables we have. Like as an instrumental marketable, these both have four vowels and therefore four syllables. And it's not quite right, but it's also not quite wrong. So in Q, if we go by the vowel count, we would see there are four vowels there. But if we say Q, it's just one syllable, Q. So it's not about how many vowels there are in the word, but how many vowel sounds there are in the word. That's gonna tell us how many syllables they are. So if we transcribe the word Q, it's K, Y, U, Q. We have just one vowel in there, so this is going to be one syllable. Now, I just mentioned that kids can do this without any linguistic training, which tells us that we do have syllables, but we could figure out how syllables work in different ways. Like we could ask speakers how they feel about syllables or what they think syllables are and get data from there. We could record audio files and we could look at how the sounds are progressing to break things up into syllables. Or we can again investigate children and see how they play with syllables. Because there's an interesting thing that happens here. So if you consider Pig Latin, some of you who have grown up in English-speaking uh, countries have probably played around with Pig Latin a little bit. It's a little game that children play where they take words in English and they transform them a little bit to create new sounds. So for example, riddle becomes it'll ray, eat becomes eat a. And the general idea behind this, if you ask a child how to explain this, they'll say you take the beginning of the word if it's a consonant, and you put it at the end and then add a to it. So in the case of riddle, you take the beginning, r, you put it to the end of the word, and add an a sound to get it'll ray. In the case of eat, there is no consonant at the beginning, so you don't move it to the end, you just add a to the end. In fact, there's some versions of Pig Latin where you'd add ye, so eat ye rather than eat a. Now the question is, what do kids do with a word like strength? And it's pretty systematic. What children will always do with a word like strength is they'll do ankh stray. So they'll take the str at the beginning and they'll move it to the end rather than saying trength say and just moving the first letter. Now this is interesting because this means that children understand that syllables exist and there's different components to them. So if we transcribe this, we get str, ankh. So we have seven sounds here. And from this, we can gather there are basically three parts. There's a rhyming part. So there's the part where the syllable is hosted, which is the nucleus. There's something called the coda, which takes in extra consonants. These two nucleus and coda join together to form a rhyme. So if we wanted to rhyme with strength, we'd have to find another word that end in ankh. And then everything at the beginning is considered an onset and the onset joins in with the rhyme to create a complete syllable. So what children are doing is subconsciously, without knowing anything about syllable structure, how syllables are formed theoretically, they're able to take the full onset and they're able to move it to a new syllable and add A to it in order to make a new word. So children are aware of onsets even without any formal training, which leads us to believe that onsets do in fact exist in language, which gives us the different components of our syllable. So this is the general structure of a syllable. A syllable is just any phonological unit composed of one or more segments and it must contain a nucleus. So the general idea is in a word like steals, first we have to transcribe it because we're dealing with sounds, not with spelling. The vowels are going to be the nuclei of our syllables. The coda is going to be any 
leftover consonants. The nucleus and coda form together to make the rhyme. It's spelled R-I-M-E. Some textbooks will also spell this typically with rhyme, R-H-Y-M-E. And the consonants at the beginning form our onset. So all of these must adhere to phonotactics. So when you take a look at onsets and codas, you have to remember to consider the phonotactics of the language that you're looking at. This means that syllable structures in different languages might look slightly different. They'll have all the same components, but the ways that the sounds uh, break up into onsets and codas might differ. So our top symbol is called a syllable. This is sigma. You want the Greek letter for it, the Greek pronunciation, but they both start with S, so that's what we use for syllables. So how do we construct a syllable structure? The first thing we're going to do is with any case of words, we're going to transcribe them into IPA because we need to be dealing with sounds in order to get the correct syllable structure. So extreme would be e, k, s, t, r, e, and m. Now, based on how many vowels we have, we should be having two syllables, ek and street. What about in the case of amazing? Well, we have a, uh, m, mm, a, s, e, and m. Mm. So according to how many vowels we have, we should have one, two, three syllables, or if we say amazing, that's exactly what we get. So once we have everything transcribed into IPA, here are the steps we're gonna take. First, every single vowel is going to get a nucleus. So in extreme, we're going to have two syllables, so we need two nuclei. And those nuclei are going to build into a rhyme, which can take a coda at some point, and that rhyme will eventually form with an onset to form a syllable. So this is how I would start the diagram for extreme. If we do the same thing with amazing, a uh, is a nucleus that builds into a rhyme that builds into a syllable. A is the same thing. Diphthongs are just one sound, so they both are underneath the nucleus. And in I, it would be the same thing. So this is our first step after transcribing our word into IPA. Our next step is to form onsets. Now we always form onsets before codas. And how we can form onsets is by thinking about the longest acceptable sequence of consonants that can be in an onset. And this is called the maximum onset principle, also known as the MOP. So if we think about the word extreme, we can ask ourselves, okay, we have this cluster of consonants here, A-S-T-R. Can we start a word with K-S-T-R? And the answer is no. There's no word in English that allows kstr, kstr at the beginning of a word. So the K cannot be part of an onset. What about the S-T-R, str? Well, yeah, we can say stream. That's totally fine, or strength. So the S-T and R together are going to form the onset of our second syllable and that will connect up to the syllable boundary. Now, in the case of ek, in our first syllable, there's no consonants to the left of the nucleus, so we don't have an onset to consider. Now, what about in amazing? Well, it's pretty similar in this case. Uh, we take a look at our cluster of consonants to the left of every nucleus. So yeah, we can start a word with m, that's fine. So m can be an onset. Uh, same with z or zing. Z can be an onset. So we can stick that under the onset of the third syllable. Now, at this point, all we have left are some consonants with no places to go. So this is where we go with step four, and we introduce those straggling consonants as codas. So in the case of extreme, we have e, and we have a k stranded there. So k is going to be the coda of the first syllable. And in stream, we have the m hanging out. So it's going to be the coda of the second syllable. And then once we've completed all of our syllables in our structure, we usually connect them together to form a prosodic word, otherwise known as a word. You might even see a PR word up there to mean prosodic word rather than power word or something like that. But we'll just use WD for word. And that just tells us that our syllables are linked into forming one coherent word. Now, in the case of amazing, all we have is the N, mm, which is a straggler on the right. So we'll fit that into the syllable to its left. They get a, me, zing, and these three will join together to form a word. So that is how we can form syllable structures in English.
So as we can see here, we have our final syllable structures for these two words, ek stream and amazing. These might take a little bit to get used to, but it's a very systematic process. So if you can do it for one word, you can do it for pretty much any English word out there. There might be some cases that are a little bit more complex where a coda and onset are basically shared by the same sound. We won't get into that, but if you take a linguistics course, you may see some problem sets where that happens, but that typically waits until a second course in phonology. So let's see if you can create syllable structures for the words foxes and informative. So you can pause it, try it yourself. But first, what we're going to do is transcribe the word. So foxes, f, a, k, s, t, z. So we have six sounds there for foxes. What we're going to do is we're going to give each vowel a nucleus, rhyme, and syllable spine, because that is where syllables are being hosted. Then we'll take a look to the left of each of our nuclei and take a look at all the consonants to see if they can form a word at the beginning. So in the case of foxes, the first syllable, yeah, we can start a word with the letter F, the sound F, that's fine. What about X? Well, we can't start a word in English with KS, X. So K and S aren't going to be an onset together, but we can start with S just on its own. So S is going to be the onset of our second syllable. And now that we have all of our onsets built, we can now dump the remaining sounds into codas in the syllable to the left. So foxes, and these two join together to create a word. Now, what about in a case like informative? Well, it's gonna be very similar. We're just going to have to transcribe this informative. You might notice here that I'm just using a regular O in informative, and that's usually because when O appears before L or R, it is not a diphthong, it is shortened, and it's just the O in this case. But there's nothing wrong with writing informative. So we're gonna do the same thing. Every single vowel sound is going to get a nucleus, which builds up into a rhyme and a syllable. So we could just fill out all of these in this case, informative, informative. So we should have four syllables, which if we build our spines, we can see exactly that. Now we're gonna build up some onsets. So it doesn't have anything to the left, but O has an NF. Can we start a word with NF in English? No, we can't say like NF or NF, but we can do o F on its own. So F is going to be the onset. And then for formative, we can ask ourselves the same thing. Can we do RM at the beginning of a word in English? The answer is no, but we can do just M. So we can stick M into the onset of our third syllable, and then with tiv, we just have a T to attach, so we can attach T as an onset. Now that all of our onsets are built, we can now dump our remaining consonants into coda positions to get the syllable structure in for m tiv. And we can join all of these together to create a prosodic word. So that's how we can do syllable structures in English. Hopefully at this point you're able to do that. And we can now move into other aspects of phonology like sonority. I'm just gonna briefly talk about sonority, but we can also think about syllables having different levels of sonority. In other words, how loud a sound can be and how, uh, how the air flows from inside to outside of your mouth. Generally, the higher sonority, the more equal the air pressure is inside and outside your mouth. And the idea is that syllables start with low sonority, peak at a high sonority, and then go down. So in a case like plan, p has lower sonority than ul, which has lower sonority than a, but a has higher sonority than n. So it's like the syllable is just a peak of sonority. And that's why when we have the word like le pan or l pan, it doesn't quite work in English because l has a higher sonority than p. So this should be a syllable if we want to produce it. We need to put some vowel in between to make it sound a little bit better. And then pan would be its own syllable. So we don't just have one steady peak here, therefore the word is going to be invalid. In multi multisyllabic words, you would end up having multiple different peaks. Uh, like let's say you had blah and then n down here, 
clan net, something like that. The seniority, uh, sorry, the sonority isn't quite perfect there, but it does get the idea across of having two different peaks and the vowels should be each of those peaks. So if I actually redo this according to the chart, if I look at pl, a, n, e, t for planet, it would be a one, it would be a three, a five, a two, a five, and a one. So our sonority would look a little bit like this. And you can very clearly see two peaks corresponding to two syllables.